Whenever anyone mentions ARM, there's always going to be someone who shows up to talk about Risk v So let's talk about what it is and also what it's not, because there's a lot of people who look at Risk v and see it as, you know, this ultimate panacea for computing, and it's going to improve everything. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So one other thing is the name is Risk v but it's pronounced as Risk v because the V is Roman numerals for 5. I don't actually care how you pronounce it though, but some people get really bothered about it. Before we get into the details, Risk v is known as an instruction set architecture, commonly shortened down to ISA. Now another ISA you've probably seen before is what you see in your typical desktop and laptop CPU from Intel and AMD. So those are going to be x86 or x86-64 CPUs, and x86-64 is commonly shortened down to x64. And in your smartphone, you're probably going to see an ARM CPU, and that is another ISA as well. Now without spending the entire video talking about x86 and ARM, Basically what they are is the language understood at the CPU level, so it's the assembly language of the CPU. Typically when you're writing programs, you don't write in assembly language, you write in something like say C, or Python, or JavaScript, or C++. And what's going to happen when you compile or interpret that language is it's going to be turned into the assembly language needed for the CPU on your system. Now unlike x86 owned by Intel, or x64 owned by AMD, Risk v isn't a proprietary architecture, so with those CPU architectures, if, say, Intel wants to make a 64-bit CPU, they actually license that technology from AMD. And in the past, the exact same thing happened from AMD to Intel as well. And the reason why anyone can go and make a Risk v CPU is because it's licensed under Creative Commons 4.0. So anyone with the equipment and the know-how is entirely free to build a CPU with it and extend it as they wish. You don't even need the know-how. As long as you can build a CPU, you're entirely free to do so. And due to it being under Creative Commons 4.0, there's no need to pay any licensing fees to anyone. You're just completely free to use it. Now, one thing to note about Creative Commons is because it's under that license, if someone makes an extension to the architecture, this extension can be proprietary. And this means that if, say, there's an extension that's made by some company and this extension becomes incredibly important, that can still have licensing fees attached to it, which can basically create the exact same issue we're in right now. And due to how Risk v is licensed, the manufacturer of a product doesn't even need to say that it actually contains a Risk v CPU. So let's say you have some random, I don't know, smart toaster because you bought a smart toaster for some reason. That could very well have a Risk v CPU in it, and you would have absolutely no idea unless they decided to tell you. Now, I do want to talk about this name for just a moment. So, RISC V stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer 5. So, basically, what it is is the fifth iteration of the RISC architecture to come from Berkeley University. So, you might be wondering, what is this reduced instruction set? Because if there's a reduced instruction set, it must be reduced compared to something else. So we have two main categories that an ISA falls into. We have Reduced Instruction Set Computer, otherwise known as RISC, or Complex Instruction Set Computer, otherwise known as CISC. Now, a common example of a CISC architecture is going to be something like, say, x86 or x64. Now, technically, they're not entirely CISC architectures. This is the thing about RISC and CISC. They're not entirely rigid categories. You can have, say, parts of a CPU that is RISC and parts of a CPU that are CISC, but generally, it's considered to be more CISC than it is RISC. One of the defining features of a RISC architecture is that every single CPU instruction takes a single CPU cycle to run. If it would take multiple cycles to run, that instruction should be split into multiple new instructions. Now, unlike a CISC architecture, where you can have one instruction which takes, you know, 5 or 10 CPU cycles to run, but it also does much more work with that single instruction. But this does mean that in a RISC architecture, it takes more instructions to do the exact same thing as a CISC architecture. So, here's a very simple example. Let's say that you wanted to add two numbers together. In a CISC architecture, what you might do is say, okay, here's number one, here's number two, I'm just going to add them together, and then we're done. But in a RISC architecture, what you would need to do is fetch the number from memory, then you would have to add the numbers together, and then put the number back in memory, and these would have to be all explicit instructions. 
Now that doesn't mean the Cisco architecture is just getting free performance out of nowhere because it has to do all the exact same things, it's just combining all of those actions into a single instruction instead. Now due to all the CPU instructions being so small and taking a single cycle to run, they can also all be given a standardized size. Now on a Cisco CPU, Technically, you can standardize their sizes, but some of your instructions take one cycle to run, some of them take 10. What's going to happen here is you have to make them all the size of the largest instruction, which leads to having a bunch of wasted memory. And that is exactly why you don't standardize instruction sizes when you're building a CISC CPU architecture. Now, pipelining is a standard function on basically any CPU. It's a way to basically have parallelism on a single CPU, allowing you to execute multiple instructions at the same time. But because all of these instructions have the exact same size on a RISC CPU, it's much easier to build this pipeline. It can still be done on a CISC architecture. It just takes a bit more work to do. Obviously, compiler optimization is important regardless of what your architecture is, but it's especially so on a RISC architecture because it breaks down these complex instructions into more smaller instructions, which provides more ways that you can optimize, and if it's poorly optimized, how you can slow the system down. So now that that's out of the way, why should you even care about RISC-V? So RISC-V is an open technology. It's an open technology like let's say Linux is. And by focusing the computing industry's efforts on this open technology, what it's going to do is allow everyone to work on this technology together rather than trying to build these completely incompatible standards and reinventing the wheel over and over again, wasting all these resources in the process. And that's not to say that there would be no competition in that respect, because what you would see happen is everyone working from the exact same baseline and then working on extensions that go along with that and pushing up changes to the main project, like you see with, say, Linux, for example. So everyone who's involved with Linux is all working on the same sort of Linux kernel, but everyone's trying to make it work in their own better way. And I feel like that's what RISC-V could really be. And due to the lack of licensing fees, it opens up the ability for people to actually experiment with this architecture. So you can have, say, new companies who want to get involved in the CPU space get involved with RISC-V. Or people who just enjoy hacking stuff. Obviously, they won't be able to build something that could go into, like, a smartphone. But someone in their garage could go and actually work on the RISC-V architecture and hack around with it and see what they can actually do with it. Now, all of that is just a potential future, and not everyone is as hopeful. So, personally, I don't expect RISC-V to overthrow ARM or overthrow x86 really anytime soon. But it seems to have great potential in the embedded space, and in a lot of cases, it's actually already being used specifically for controller chips. So, I believe it was Western Digital and NVIDIA are actually already using RISC-V CPUs to actually manage parts of their devices. So in the case of NVIDIA, while they wouldn't be replacing their GPU cores with RISC-V, it still does have an important place in their product. We're still in the very, very early days of RISC-V, so right now you can't even run a full version of Android on it, there is a project that is working on it, and they've managed to get a minimal version of Android 10 running, but it's not the sort of thing you'd be running on your smartphone. It is a very, very stripped down version of Android. So one day, that will be complete, and one day maybe we'll see a RISC-V smartphone, but I don't know whether it's going to become the dominant architecture. I really don't know. Maybe it will happen, but for now, we really have to wait and see. But there are definitely some companies who have a vested interest in RISC-V actually taking off. So both Google and NVIDIA are very big backers of the RISC-V project. And together, they could completely shift the direction of the processing industry. But the biggest problem with any sort of ISA change, this is the problem that Apple is dealing with right now, is early developer support. So Apple is a special case because they have such a tight-knit grip on the developer community who actually work on Apple devices. So that was probably the smoothest transition that could ever happen. But for something that's a bit more open like this, where you're still gonna have x86 CPUs that exist, and you're still gonna have ARM, and you're then gonna have RISC-V as well, then it becomes kind of a bit more of a mess to deal with. But with the case of NVIDIA, they sort of threw a spanner into the mix by wanting to acquire ARM. So I don't exactly know what's gonna happen there, 
being backers of the Risk Five project and also wanting to own Arm, I don't know whether they're going to drop out of the project and then focus entirely on Arm, or whether they're going to try to move Arm to working on Risk Five. I really don't know what Nvidia's plan with this company is going to be. But with NVIDIA's acquisition of ARM, that sort of does open up something new, and that is whether Apple is going to continue working with ARM because they don't really have the best relationship with NVIDIA. So are they going to shift their focus towards RISC-V? Are they going to keep working on ARM? I don't know. And then countries like China don't really like NVIDIA either, so are they going to start shifting towards RISC-V? I don't know. Really, this is only speculation, and only time will tell at this point. What I can say though is the next 10 to 20 years of computing is going to be really interesting and I really recommend keeping your eye on it. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Corbinian, Andre, Nathan, David Montezar, Will, Chico Bento, Joseph Mitchell, Pity D, Tony Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you want to support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, Libra Pay, Subscribe Star, all of that stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch it on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.